We are in a series called Giants, where we look at giants in our lives that steal our peace, steal our joy, and, and not just that, not just discovering these giants, but finding out how we can overcome these giants in our lives. We all have giants to face, face uh, on a, sometimes on a daily basis, and I want to help you overcome these giants one by one. Last week, we talked about the giant of fear, and several people came to me saying, I am here for this particular giant because it is something I live with, and we were able to find out, discover more about fear and how to overcome that fear, uh, but now we're going to be moving on to our next giant. Now, I live out in Waterford, uh, and so it's out on 132, not, to, not particularly close, it's a little bit of a drive, uh, but I enjoy it because it's good country driving. And if you go out 132, you, you get even more of the country. And as you drive along the 132 outside of Waterford towards the east, you come across a barren place called the Roberts Ferry Cemetery. Okay, now, if, now I, I drive past it all the time. When I was commuting before I was a pastor here, I was commuting to the hospital at uh, the Adventist the Hospital in Sonora, and I would pass this daily. And it was always just this barren place. Uh, unlike many cemeteries, it didn't have the nice grass that's well manicured. It didn't have a, a visitor center with somebody to help you find some old headstones. Uh, it was, it's just simply dirt and some of these headstones that you see here. Now, several of the founders of Waterford are buried out there and founders of the town of Roberts Ferry are there. But that's just, that's all it is. It's just dirt and headstones and this really rinky-dink sign uh, right off the, the highway that says Roberts Ferry Cemetery. Of course, I just mentioned we, yesterday we had a memorial service for, for Joanne, uh, Michael's, uh, Jen's mom, and uh, I was reminded yesterday just I observe people. I, I like to watch people. Uh, even though I'm talking, um, I, I, I'm, I'm often scanning and, and, and seeing either the person I'm talking to or somebody who's walking by. People give off cues, uh, body language. And I've learned to read that through the years just because of my sales career. Um, and and uh, funerals are a place that can bring up a sense of loneliness. And, and sure, when you're at a funeral, there's going to be people there. They're, they're there to honor the past life with you. And, and even at a funeral, you may have your family there to kind of help you through those tough times. But inside, when you're at one of these funerals, on the inside, you wonder... If anyone could know how you really feel. Because when you come to a funeral, yeah, you, you may be crying. Yeah, you may be surrounded by family. But you put this image, you put up this front, and you wonder, does anybody know how it feels on the inside? Could anybody know how horrible I feel at a funeral? And, and every time I go past a place like this, not just any cemetery, but I go to, well, when I drive past the Roberts Ferry Cemetery, it's a stark reminder that the cemetery is a lonely place. That a funeral is a lonely place, even surrounded by people. You can feel all alone. True loneliness is what this landscape reminds me of. And so today, the giant that we will face off against is the giant of loneliness. According to a Harvard study, one in three people feel the following way. One in three people. You have needs in your life and no one to meet them. You have hurts to share and no one to listen to them. You have love to give and no one to receive it. More than one in three Americans feel this way. It's over 30 it's about 35, 36 percent. 
And may I tell you this? God did not intend for life to be that way. He did not create us to live with those feelings of loneliness. And some of you are thinking, well, I've lived with it for a long time. How is it that God didn't create me this way? So when God created humanity, he created us with a reason. And that is to have a relationship with him. We see in the very first chapters of the Bible how he created Adam and then he created Eve. And they began to have families. And, and the whole reason was God would come down to earth and walk with them. Converse with them. Have a relationship with them. He created something and he wanted a relationship with them. It's kind of like, you know, with your kids. If you create them, build a relationship with them. The problem with American society is we've got so many parents who created people and they don't want anything to do with them anymore. They fix it to, brother. It's coming. And God did not create us to be this way. He created us to be in relationship. In fact, even before he created us. There was relationship. There was no loneliness. You would think, what, what, happened, what was life like before there was this universe? Before God created everything in it, including humanity, so that he can have a relationship with us. There was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they lived in communion. They knew what love was before anything else was created. And I realize that for some of you, that's like mind-blowing because you, you, you just can't wrap your head around it before time. But from what we see in the Bible, this is how God knew what love and relationship was because of the relationship that God, the Trinity, had. Before the universe even existed, there was no loneliness. So don't think that, oh, in that vast expanse of nothingness and there was just blackness and, and no space and no... That there had to be a lonely place. It was not. God, even then, was overcoming loneliness. When Jesus resurrected and ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit to build the church. And we spent four months talking about the Holy Spirit and how he's important to your life and to the, this church's life. The church is supposed to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. And I realize that we often think of ways to reach outside of our church to the lost. We have a food ministry. We're even talking about uh, putting together a clothes, clothes closet for our community. And we want to reach to the outside of our church. But one of the most important functions of the church is on the inside. One of the, the chief functions of this church is on the inside. And we see this in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to read through verse 40 through 44. It says, And with many other words, he testified, talking about the Apostle Peter, and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly, talking about this group of Christians that have now been saved, the thousands. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. We see from the very beginning of the church, from the very beginning when, when Jesus left and the Holy Spirit came, we see at the very beginning of the church's history that it was meant to come together in loving community where we can help each other and love each other and care for each other. Yesterday, I got to sit next to a neighbor of Joanne's whose name was Joanne. And I said, Joanne, where do you go to church? She goes, oh. Well, I'm part of, my membership is in a church. Um, I come from the Vermont area, so my membership's over there. And I said, that's your church? Yeah. So you don't go to church here? No. How often do you get back there? Oh, once or twice a year. So that's all you go to church? Yeah. And you're okay with that? Yeah. And then the flip was switched. And I went into full Chris Henry mode. <laughs> 
And she didn't stay next to us for very much longer. She ate and left. It. <laughs> Some people are completely content with having a Christian life with zero community. No community. Okay, now Hebrews, the author of Hebrews told us, do not forsake the gathering together of Christians. Talking about coming to church, coming to be in fellowship. He says, as, uh, as some people do, some Christians do it this way. Don't be that way, but rather meet more and more, even as you see Christ's return approaching. Okay, there's been no generation that's seen Jesus Christ's return approaching. His, his, the rapture is on its way. The return is coming soon. We should be gathering together more and more. The Bible commands us, tells us, we need to be in community in the church. And listen, if the Bible tells you to do something and you don't do it, what does that mean? You're living in sin. <gasps> Chris, oh, pastor. How could you? Listen, well, if the Bible tells you to do something, do it. There's a reason for it. And it's not just so it could get you in trouble. The author that wrote that knows that when you come into a church, when you're part of a community of Christians, it changes your life. And it changes others' lives. You have an opportunity to change somebody else's life. And so that's why we do this. That's why we come to church, because this is what God has told us. To do, And I have a vision for this church, and I've had this vision for this church since the very moment Beverly and I got here almost five years ago. And I've tried to show it, we've tried to show it through how our family exists in this church. That this, this church, Hope Tree Church, is not just a place to meet for a weekly production of music and teaching. I don't ever want this church to be just that for you or for anybody else. I don't want you to think this is this is the place where we've got this giant play, this giant production, this work of art where there's music uh, and there's prayers and there's teaching. And then we go home. My vision is that people want to get here early because they got family here. And then you hear the singing, and you participate, and then you hear the teaching, and you apply it to your life. And then when the service is over, you like hanging around. Because you got family here. You got friends here. You have a Christian church community right here. I know some of you are like, I got to get out as fast as I can. I'm starving to death. All right? But if you just hold on for 10 minutes and maybe meet somebody, you don't know how they might be able to change your life. Or you might be able to encourage them when they desperately needed a friend. Amen. That's my vision for this church. That's the kind of community I want for this church. That we eat together. That we talk together. That we're not in such a hurry that we can't spend just a few minutes with our friends here who need it. And this isn't just a pastor thing. It's a Christian thing. You understand? This isn't just now. I listen. I love talking beforehand and after. Everybody's like, "Chris, what's your favorite thing to do?" I love it when everybody gets together and then I get to kind of sit and chat and and to catch up with some people, as many as people as I can before you know before the service starts or before they leave to go home. I love that part. That to me is important, and I want that to be something that you embrace and love. And I know some of you are not the 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 extroverts uh, of the crowd. Some of you are introverts. And for some of you, you're like, <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Did you know something? You, you want to know something about me? Introvert. Once upon a time. All right? Once upon a time, I had no problem just going home, being by myself, reading something. I mean, you, a Angela can attest to this, my sister. Uh, now, she, she, was, she had lots of friends during high school days and always hanging out. And I had no problem going home. Don't laugh at me. And I'd bust open, okay, because I'm a Generation X guy, <laughs> the encyclopedias. We didn't have the Internet. So to study anything, I actually had to open a book made of paper, all right? And I love to study. And I love to... But you know what? There came a time where I'm like, you know what? I, I started to hang out with some people. Hey, this is fun. 
And I took the introvert ways, and I'm like, I'm done with this. I'm done with being that way. Uh, I'm closing people off, I'm closing myself off to other people. I need community. And I was able to move myself from that introvert to whatever I am now, all right? Uh, it's beyond extrovert. I just enjoy being around people uh, and getting to talk with people. But listen, it's not just for the pastor to do, okay? It's, it's not just for, I don't want this church to be a place where the only person who talks to other people is the pastor. This isn't a pastor thing. This is a Christian thing, okay? Amen. People ask me all the time. Chris, can you go pray for this person? Of course I can. I'd love to. But did you? Come on. Chris, can you, can you reach out to this person? Can you give this person a call? Of course I can. And I'd love to. But did you reach out? There are people who I depend on in this church to reach out. Because there's no way. I mean, there's, there's probably... We have about 125 people here today, something like that. There's probably a little over 200 people who are in and out part of this congregation. There's no way I can keep up with 200 people. There's no way. And so I depend on other people. There are staff people who, who are here. Uh, my wife reaches out to people. I know uh, my uh, Angela is always just in all y'all's business, all right? So she... Uh, but. but <laughs> But, okay, not, not quite, but, but listen, it's important for us to know each other and to love each other. And, man, I, want, I will be there for you. I'm not saying quit calling me, pastor's too busy. I am not. But I'm not going to be able to get to everybody like you can. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you're in community, just think of how much, okay, think of the need that you have right now. Think, think of the chaos that you, you feel on the inside right now. What if more than one person in this building cared about that, wanted to do something about that, wanted to help you through that situation? Well, you can be that for somebody else. And that is the community that I really want to see in this church. And I realize that I've given you the challenge. I usually save the challenge for the end of the message. All right. And I'm giving you the challenge now. So now that you've heard it, I want you to embrace that. I don't want you to be uh, slip out at the end uh, and nobody knows who you are. Please find somebody and be their help, their friend, their comfort today. God's called you to do that. All right. So now that we've said that, I can begin the message. Oh, I want to take you to... Um, a passage in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And everything that we do from this point on will be based on this verse and the next one. Mark chapter 1, verse 40. So Jesus has been casting out unclean spirits. He has at this point... Healed Peter's mother-in-law. Uh, he, he, there was a Sabbath day where Jesus was healing. He was preaching in Galilee. And probably resting in between these particular times where he's been helping the people. So now we come to verse 40. And it says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing... You can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Here we find a man overcome by his infirmities. Leprosy. A disgusting disease. A terrible disease. Something you definitely don't want. You wouldn't wish this on anybody. But not just that. But we find a man who... If you understand the nature of leprosy and what it meant for your life, we find a man overcome by loneliness. This man was a lonely man. Because the disease of leprosy keeps you isolated. In the Jewish culture, you had to stay 50 steps away from everyone else. Why? Because leprosy is an airborne virus. Every time you would cough, 
Every time you would say something and it would spit, that would cause it. You, you know, that sounds familiar. About four years ago, okay, we're, we're all having to, you know, mask up and, you know, I, you know, it was six feet. The, okay, that, and of course, that we all know that that was like an arbitrary number that we just threw at the problem. But here we have, if you've got leprosy, it's not six feet; it's fifty steps. Fifty steps. They don't. If you have leprosy, you were, had to stay fifty steps away because the virus was an airborne virus and would definitely be spread by touch. If you touched somebody with that disease, you would get it. You would have it. And the problem with leprosy was it didn't just kill you. It killed you slowly. Okay, it was, it was a slow, painful death. You would have it not for weeks or months. You would have it for years, even up to a decade before it would kill you. And do you know how lonely that would be? That according to the customs, you had to stay 50 feet away from everybody, and you had to do that for years. For years. Okay, I remember how upset we were when, during COVID, we had people in nursing homes who family couldn't visit except through glass or through these, these plastic partitions. And we felt so awful. And that just lasted a few months in some states, like this one, a, a year or more. But imagine going through life for years, even up to a decade or more, and you're 50 feet away from everybody. How bad would it be? Listen, that, that, that if, you, if you had leprosy, you had to announce what you had. If you, if you had leprosy, you, you had to share that with everybody. You couldn't come into the room without saying, I'm clean. Unclean. That's what you had to say because everybody thought, oh my goodness, i got to stay away from that guy. And the rules were, if you did to scream unclean, the people around you, if they find that you have leprosy, they could stone you to death right there. Some people would probably accept that after, after a little bit of having leprosy. But just, just imagine how bad it would be that you have to walk into the room and you have to announce yourself by what's wrong with you. Anybody follow me here? Imagine walking into a room and the first thing you have to do is announce what's wrong with you. If you had leprosy, you actually had to tear your clothes. You had to rip your clothes apart, shred them, so that everybody just saw you and they knew. They, you didn't even necessarily had to scream unclean because of the way your clothing was, the way it was shredded in a certain way. They knew that you had leprosy. And you'd come in and you'd yell unclean. Or if you came into an area where there was a group of people, you would scream unclean. And if you, again, if you didn't say it, you could be stoned to death. And the reason was to protect others. The reason these laws were in place was to protect the population from having a leprosy outbreak. See, the problem with this situation is you're identified by your issues. When you, when you were a leper, you had to be identified by your issues. Before anyone knew you, you were identified by what people saw. And you're an outcast because of what they see. They didn't care how nice you were. They didn't, they, they didn't care how good a person you've been. They don't care what dreams you have. They don't care about what you love to do. They didn't care about you at all. All they cared about was your issue. Your problem. And what does that sound like? Hmm, uh, maybe today. Maybe it sounds like people in general. Because I don't see things that they've changed all that much. Because today, people still want to focus on your issue. People still want to focus on your sin. People still want to focus on your failures. That's what people want to do. They want to focus on you. They want to focus on how did Chris Henry fail? How did Dan Barr blow it today? People are that way. They're looking for your spots. See, when you had leprosy, you had spots and sores on your body that said that you were a leper. People are still today looking for your spots. They want to find out what your spot is. 
And some of us don't have necessarily this leprous spot on the outside, but we have a blemish on the inside, a problem of the mind or emotions. Just about all of us have one. Amen. One honest person. All right. We all have a problem that we deal with. These giants that we deal with. If we don't have one giant, we probably got a bunch of giants coming after us. We don't have a blemish on the outside. Our blemishes are on the inside. And people want to know what it is. And people want to point it out. You know, don't, don't, don't claim you don't have one. It's that one thing that, that people know about you. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, there's that one thing that people know about you. And they talk about it. They criticize you for that one thing. They talk to their friends about that one thing that you got wrong with you. How many would you, of you would, you would you continue to show up Sunday after Sunday if every time that you walked in through that door, you had to announce your issue? The issue that you struggle with. You had to come in. I'm a thief. You come in. I got an anger problem. And that's how you announce yourself. I have a lust and porn problem. And that's how you announce yourself every time you come in. Would you show up to anywhere if you had to announce that. And that's where we find this leper. Every time he showed up, he had to announce his problem. And if you had to do that, you know what you would do? Isolate. The last thing you would want to do is be around other people. Because if they know what your problem is, and then you, you know, you're having to declare, even, even if you don't have to declare, the fact that they know what your problem is, you walk into that room and that's all you're thinking about. Oh, they know. I know what they're talking about. I know that they're running me into the ground. And you know what you end up wanting to do? You want to isolate. You want to hide. You want to get to a place where nobody sees you anymore because you don't want to have to face the old problem. You have that problem that you live with every day. The last thing you want to do is have everybody else know about it, talk about it. And you would be right to do so to isolate yourself. And that's where we find this leper. Why would he want to be around anybody if he has to keep declaring this leprosy? It's been a long misunderstood disease. It was thought that this disease simply caused parts of your body to begin to rot and fall off. Uh, and, and then that, once it was starting to rot, it would spread. It's, it was, like I said, it's a gross disease, terrible disease. Okay, and that's not the way a leprosy works. Leprosy is a nervous system disorder. It's a nervous system. So if you, if, you have, if you have diabetes and you have diabetic neuropathy, you have just a small taste of what leprosy was like. Okay, you know how it starts to, for, for a while, it starts to itch and burn in your fingertips and your, your, your toes. And you begin to lose feeling when you have diabetic neuropathy. Leprosy was like that, but it was a lot faster. And you would begin to lose those tips of your fingers and toes, and, and pretty soon it would just spread because it's a, it's a neurological problem. You begin to feel numb. You would have infection, and you wouldn't know what was going on. You would get numb right here, but the problem is when the numbness comes on, you start to scratch it, and you create a, a source of infection, and then it begins to, you, you got problems. I can go into details of how horrible leprosy was and how, uh, how bad it was, and I'm not going to gross you out, but here's the problem. The problem with leprosy is it makes you numb. And as you get this infection, the numbness starts, with the pain, the itching, the scratching, and, and it's a slow death. It's a horrible death. Just, it's like the worst thing. And that's why there were rules for them to stay away from the population centers because nobody wanted to deal with that. The infection would set in. You couldn't feel anything. You slowly began losing pieces of your skin and your body. You were numb. And we see this man come to Jesus. We see this leper come to Jesus. He hadn't felt anything in a long time. And I'm not talking about his body from the leprosy. I'm talking about the fact that he's probably been isolating himself for years. And he's been numb. He hadn't felt anything for years because of the lack of human contact. 
That's a lonely place. That's where we find this man today. Many, many people try to numb themselves. We've, we, we, we find ourselves numb, but some people have so much pain that they try to they take it into their own hands. And they begin to take drugs to find numbness. They begin to drink alcohol like it's water because they don't want to feel and they want to create this numbness. Some people feel so much pain that they seek illicit relationships trying to shake the numbness. They're so numb to the world that they go out and seek the things that they know they shouldn't. This is what humanity does. This is what people do when we're so numb from the pain. We end up doing something even worse. Even worse. And this is how we, we numb our pain from the loneliness. This was the life of a leper. It was absolute loneliness. Some of you have come here today, and many times you've come to this church service feeling lonely. The loneliness has been in there. This Wednesday, we had, a, uh, we had an amazing concert. I don't know if you were here, you were here. It was great. Um, the Needhams were here. And it was just awesome. We had such a great time. Before that, the Henry family tends to sing a few songs just to warm up the crowd, get everything going before we have the, the, the main group come and step up. And uh, I had picked out a few of our older songs that we hadn't done in a while, um, just to throw them out there. And uh, there was a friend of ours who was here, sitting right over here in the third row. His name was, well, I won't tell you his name, but he was a, a good friend. He used to be here in this area for the longest time, came to all of our concerts. Great sound, man. And just a great Christian gentleman. He had moved out um, out of state uh, quite some distance. And it wasn't long before he found out that his wife had Alzheimer's. Um, and uh, she dealt with that. It didn't get horribly severe. And then she ended up having cancer on top of that. And the cancer took her before the Alzheimer's did, which he did tell me he was thankful for. Um, it, he says, it's the answer to prayer. It's not the answer to the prayer that I wanted. But... Um, but he came to me and we had sung um, the song entitled, But God. And he came to me after the concert and he says, I know you were just throwing some old songs out there, but I feel like the Holy Spirit was telling you to pick that song because it was for me. It was a song about how God sees life from a different perspective. And sometimes we just don't. <laughs> We see it from our human perspective, from our own perspective, but God sees it different. And he says, man, that song dug me out of a dark spot. I was in a bad place in that moment. He says, the darkness of the loneliness. His wife passed three months ago. And he was living in that loneliness. And, and, and still is, but he says, for that moment, that song dug me out. And listen, I don't know what that loneliness is like to lose a spouse. That's got to be brutal. I don't know what it's like to lose a child. That's got to be the worst pain you could possibly feel. I don't know what that's like. I can't understand that. But I'm so glad that I have a God who does understand it. Who does understand it. And at moments, he will give us glimmers of light in the middle of our darkness. When we are alone alone. In the darkness of our life, in the alone and feeling the loneliness of our grief, God comes down and says, I got something just for you. Okay, I, I can't replace what you've lost, but I'm here for you. God. Right here. I'm right here. And again, some of you come here weekly feeling that loneliness. Maybe it's from the loss of a spouse or a child or somebody that you cared about. And, and, and you come in here with that kind of loneliness. Let's go back to the, you know what? Yeah. Let's just go to that, that uh, the next verse. And we're going to read the verse that we read earlier. And then how Jesus replied. It says, now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Ha, I am willing. Be cleansed. Be cleansed. If you watch The Chosen, there's a, the first video clip I ever saw of this 
was Jesus healing that leper. And uh, you're just going to have to go home and watch it. <laughs> we don't have time for it today, but we see this man willing to be seen and willing to have his issue exposed. This is important. Now imagine his loneliness. Imagine he hasn't been able to touch or to have been touched by another human being probably for years at this point. Every time he shows up, people run. People scatter. They never talk to him like a normal human would. And, 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 and how could you? You know what his problem is. The last thing you want is to be his friend. I don't want to be your friend because if we're friends, you're going to want to get close to me and then I might have what you have. We could be that way. But understand this. Understand this part of, of the story. Here comes Jesus with his disciples and the leper comes around the corner and the disciples are probably freaking out. Oh my goodness, here comes a leper. And he comes to Jesus, running straight at him, knowing he's not supposed to do that. He exposes his issue to everybody around him. He's not isolating anymore. He's coming to Jesus because he's heard that Jesus can do something for him. That he might be able to heal him from this horrible disease and rid him of this isolation and this loneliness that he has. And, and, and now, now th this is interesting. Jesus is the Word of God. In fact, John calls Him the Word of God. When God the Father speaks, Jesus is the physical manifestation of that Word in this universe. He is the Word. That's why He says Jesus is the Word of God, because when it's spoken, Jesus is the action. He's the, he, he's the one that makes it happen. That's why the Bible says, by Jesus all things are made, because He is the action of God in this universe. Now, just get this. Jesus has been saying to everybody, be healed, be cleansed. Yes, you're healed. Just by speaking, he can heal somebody. But instead, the leper comes up to him, and Jesus does this. The last thing you would ever do to a leper. You don't know where his sores are. You don't know that you've cut your hand and now you're completely infected. But Jesus doesn't speak. He comes up and he says, I am willing. He puts his hand on the leper and says, I am willing. Be cleansed. Be healed. And I think this is an important part of what we see in this lesson is that Jesus wasn't willing to just say, yeah, be healed. And I don't want to have anything to do with you, okay? Jesus knew the loneliness in this man's heart. Knew that not only had he not been spoken to on purpose in a gentle and kind way for years, but hadn't even been touched. And Jesus says, that ends right now. And he does what no one else would be willing to do. Go beyond speaking and touching the man. He decided to do something that communicates something more than words could ever say. It's why when we get here to church, we say hello, and then we shake hands. We say hi to our friends, and then we give each other a hug. Human touch, affectionate and appropriate, is important. <laughs> Did you get that last part? All right. <laughs> Jesus goes beyond words and touches the leper. Jesus goes to the heart of the matter with this man and breaks through the main culprit. And I'm going to give you the main culprit of all loneliness. It's shame. Shame creates loneliness. Shame can come in all sorts of different ways. Some people feel shame for what they've done. Maybe it's something that you've done that's really bad. And for years, maybe, 
for years, you've lived with that shame, hoping that no one would know. And yet, you feel like everyone knows. Have you ever felt that way? Don't raise your hand. But you feel the shame of something that you've done, and you feel like everybody knows. Even though hardly anybody knows, but you feel like everyone does. And you carry that shame. You live with that shame. Some people have shame because of maybe how you were raised. Maybe you were raised in poverty. And you carry that shame, you know, when you went to school and you had the poorest clothes. You had shoes from Payless Shoe Source. You had shirts and jeans from the local series in Kmart that doesn't even exist anymore. And maybe you bore that shame through life. Maybe, maybe your parents ended up in jail. And it brought shame on the family. And you took that to school as you grew up in that. And because you grew up as a kid in that shame, whether it be poverty or, or whatever it may be, you carried that shame right into the rest of your life. And you hid it. And you didn't carry it. And you know what that does? It just creates more loneliness. Because you, you, you did, maybe some, listen, maybe someone did something to you. Yeah. Maybe something, somebody did something to you, and it wasn't your fault. But what they did to you was so heinous that you still bear the shame of that. It wasn't your fault. But you carry the shame of that moment because it was such an ugly moment. And you carry that shame years later, feeling dirty. It wasn't your fault, but you feel that shame. And let me tell you what shame does. It just brings loneliness. Shame brings on loneliness. It makes you feel like you need to create a new identity. Because of what, the, the, because of the shame that you feel in your life. It makes you want to take on a new identity. Sure, you're, you're on social media. But the social media is only showing the you that keeps your shame in the darkness. Maybe uh, you talk with friends on the phone all the time, but you never let them know what you've got buried because of the shame of that. Maybe you meet with people all the time, but the shame that you carried from your childhood, you're sure to cover up with a different version of you. And you create a fake persona, a fake identity because of that shame. And no one knows the real you. And you know what that does? You already know. It creates loneliness because you're living in it. And you never want to know, you, you never want anyone to know who you are. But you really wish that someone did. You really wish someone did. That they did know the real you. That they knew the real you and they still loved you. Still wanted to care for you. Still wanted to be your friend no matter what. Well, guess what? There is someone willing. He said, I am willing. Be cleansed. Be healed. Be whole. Don't carry that shame anymore. Don't live in that loneliness anymore because I am willing to step into your situation. There is someone who loves you no matter who you are. He knows the real you and he loves you no matter what. There is someone who cares for you. And I love that Bible passage that we just read because it says that Jesus didn't care about the required distance between him and this man. He didn't care that this person was part of the outcast. He didn't even care that associating with that leper would mean that other people wouldn't want to associate with Jesus anymore. Jesus said in verse 41, I am willing. I am willing to come to where you are. To take the shame and, and I see it. And Jesus says, I'm ready to start over with you. I'm ready to leave this life behind and just get over to this other side. 
I want to move into a different place. He's willing to take away your shame. He's willing to stop this slow death because that's what shame is. Shame is just an internal leprosy. It's a slow death on the inside. And some of you have been feeling like that. You've been dying on the inside, only real nice and slow. And it's been killing you piece by piece. And today Jesus says, I am willing to take that shame away, to take that loneliness away. He's willing to stop the slow death. He's willing to replace the loneliness with a new identity, not a fake identity. He wants to replace you, replace it with a new identity, not the one of the torn clothes that the leper had to wear, but he wants to put on a new robe for you, a new identity, a new way that people know you now, not the way they knew you back then, but the way that they're going to know you in the future because you are covered by the love and grace of Jesus Christ and his blood has forgiven all of your sins and covered all of your shame and you are a new creation in Christ Jesus today. Today, a uh, you that belongs to Jesus is waiting. A new robe, a new you. The shame can go. The loneliness can go if we just give it over to Jesus. I just want to tell you real quick, just real, real quick. There's somebody here. Um, she's in the back right now. But she'd asked me to go visit somebody who was important to her in hospice. Um, and I went to visit her yesterday, Beverly and I, right after the funeral. We had to go and visit with her. And uh, when somebody's in hospice and you get a call, you try to go visit as soon as possible because there's a reason you're on hospice. And we went there to pray. And I prayed for, I went in, I prayed for her. And Beverly just began to pray. And let me tell you, the, the con, her condition was one that I, what you could see was there. You could see her and her breathing was labored. And I don't know if physically she was conscious of me. Her eyes were open. But she seemed in a different place. And Beverly was there just praying, God, let her hear. Let her soul hear. Let her spirit hear. Let her hear every word. And I began to pray for her over through the words. I began to pray a prayer of salvation saying, you can be forgiven. She's someone who had never given God a chance. But there at the, at the last moment, Jesus was giving her a chance. Because it didn't matter what her past had been like, what her rejection had been like, that she'd isolated maybe herself from God and from Christians and from, from, from the love of God. Jesus was saying, I am willing. Don't think that you're beyond the touch of Jesus today. I don't care who you are. I don't care. Listen. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're ashamed of today. And, and let me just put it this way. I don't think Jesus cares either. He's like, you keep, you keep bringing this stuff up to me that you're ashamed of. I'm telling you I can give you a new life, but I did this. I don't care. We're moving on. But this happened to me. I don't care. We're moving on. Leave that life in the past. It's there in the past forever. I'm here to give you a new robe. Get rid of the leprosy. You are cleansed today. Jesus says, I am willing. You are cleansed today. And so some of you needed that right there. Jesus is willing today to cleanse you. I don't need to call you up to the front. I don't need to pray. I don't need to uh, lay hands on you right now. You know why? Because Jesus just touched you. Some of you just right then. I saw it in your faces. I felt it in my spirit as your spirit was talking to the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that's in me. He said, I'm doing some healing right now. And some of you needed that moment. You need, you, the Holy Spirit brought you for this moment. Made you attentive at just the right time. To say, I'm willing. You are cleansed. That shame is gone. You don't have to live in that loneliness anymore. You've got a family here. This is a family. We don't put people down. We're not here to bury people. We're not here to, to, to cast people out because of their issues Amen. that they're having to declare at the door. Because when you walk into this door, you're a new creation in Christ. It's time for you to take that shame and put it behind you and live in the newness of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 And it's yours today. It's yours today. It's yours today. <laughs> oh, man. I want you to go home and feel that new life and know it's there. I want you to know it's there. 
And man, I want you to talk to somebody about it. Find somebody at church. You know what? This is what happened to me. You call me up. Send me an email. Send me a message on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. Tell me what God has delivered you from. And you're like, well, then you would know what I did. And I don't care what you did anymore because you're a new creation. I want to hear how God freed you from that shame and freed you from that loneliness and gave you the new life. That's what I want to hear. I love to hear how Jesus does something new. You don't have to declare that shame anymore. Because Jesus has said, I'm willing and I've cleansed you today. Amen. Amen. Will you all stand? And let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for sending your son to this earth, to die on the cross, to live a life that he knows what I went through. Jesus, thank you today for one day coming to me and saying, son, I am willing. I'm willing to cleanse you from all the filth of the past and help you move forward to get rid of it. Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you said that to me one day. And Jesus, thank you that today you said that to so many people here today who, who, who have allowed that shame to grow into this giant in their lives and turn it into loneliness and isolation. Today we are free. We are free from the shame. Because you are the one who's come to take it away and say that's your old life. It's covered by my blood. And listen, Jesus is saying here today, Jesus is saying to all of us that you all have something that you are ashamed of in your past. Don't ever hold anything against someone because you yourself have been forgiven of that shame. We all have received forgiveness of our shame. Don't hold somebody's shame against them because of the shame that you had forgiven in your life. Today, Father, we receive that forgiveness. The shame is no longer going to carry us. It's no longer going to scare us into the corner and leave us lonely and isolated like the devil would want, like our enemy would want. He would want to isolate us so he could just pick us off nice and easy. Not today, Satan. In Jesus' name, in G Jesus will rebuke you. <laughs> he rebukes you. In Jesus' name, we rebuke you out of our lives. And that shame is gone. And we are forgiven today. And we walk not as a lonely, solo pilgrim. But today we live in community. In a new church, in a new family, with the new life that you've given us today. Father, thank you for meeting us here today with your spirit. Go with us as we leave. Bless those who have come and deliver us from evil. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Go in that newness. God bless you. Go and serve your king.